All right, so we are picking up on phase two of uh, the spiritual life. <clears throat> really what we're talking about is phase two of salvation. Remember that salvation is set forth in three tenses. We have phase one, which is our justification, uh, in which we are at a moment in time uh, justified in God's sight, and this because of the imputed righteousness that is given to us freely uh, as a gift, the very gift of righteousness. Uh, phase two of the Christian life is our sanctification. It's the life that we live after salvation, after faith in Christ, and continues on until we leave this world, either by death or by rapture. And what we do with that life, uh, that is our sanctification. That is uh, ideally our advance uh, in our walk uh, with the Lord, our advance to spiritual maturity. Phase three is our glorification. That's when we leave this world and we uh, receive our new bodies uh, at that time. And uh, at that moment, we are free from the very presence of sin. So remember, phase one is we are saved from the penalty of sin. Phase two is we are saved from the power of sin. And phase three, we are saved from the very presence of sin. So tonight, we're, be we're beginning the second part of this study of the spiritual life. And I've dedicated, or I've called this dedication to God, and the spiritual journey. Now, for Christians, dedication is the starting point for the spiritual life and the advance to Christian maturity. Of course, I'm talking about this from the human side. From the divine side, God is the one who has designed the spiritual life. He is the one who has set it up for us, and we are just responding to it. So when I talk about dedication to God being the starting point, I'm talking about it from the human side, because that's what we're looking at this evening. We're going to start this study uh, where we're going to look at words like uh, commitment, devotion, loyalty, positive volition, all synonyms for the idea of being dedicated to God. Uh, because remember that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, Ephesians 1.3 tells us. And um, and so we are at, at, at the moment of positive volition laying hold of those assets and really beginning to understand who God is and what he has provided for us for our walk with him. So again, for Christians, dedication to God is the starting point for the spiritual life and the advance to Christian maturity. Dedication is a synonym for commitment, devotion, loyalty, and positive volition. I have a quote here from Dr. Charles Ryrie, and this is taken from his book, Balancing the Christian Life. Uh, page 77, and then I have another quote here in just a moment from the same book, page 80. But he says, quote, There is perhaps no more important matter in relation to the spiritual life than dedication, end quote. And in another place, he states, Dedication concerns the subjection of my life to Jesus Christ as long as I live, end quote. Now, for the Christian, dedication starts at a moment in time and continues ideally for the rest of one's life as the child of God walks in ongoing obedience to the Lord. Now, I have a, a footnote here, and I say ideally uh, because we do have examples in the Bible. In fact, we're going to spend some time on some future lessons. We'll talk about believers who turn away from the Lord. Uh, believers who fail uh, to continue to the very end. And I think of Solomon, uh, who deviated from his walk with the Lord. Uh, but we will look at Solomon. We'll also look at uh, other believers, some that are listed in the New Testament. Uh, as the footnote here, I say I, ideally because some believers, like Solomon, deviate in their walk with the Lord. Some will return to their walk of faith. Others will not. Whatever the final outcome of one's life, any spiritual advancement must begin with a moment of dedication. Now, after being born again, some believers quickly dedicate themselves to the Lord and begin their journey of spiritual growth. I think of the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus, uh, that, uh, that after his conversion, uh, it appears that he quickly surrendered himself to the Lord and began his walk with the Lord. So again, after being born again, some believers quickly dedicate themselves to the Lord and begin their journey of spiritual growth. For other Christians, this dedication may come later, perhaps even years later, as it did with me. Really, I think, um, you know, when I came to faith in Christ, it was my grandmother who led me to Christ when I was about eight years of age. 
Uh, but it wasn't until uh, a number of years later, uh, you know, roughly about 15 years later, when I finally had surrendered myself, and this after taking uh, some pretty serious lickings from the Lord, because remember, he whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And I needed to be humbled, and so that was part of my um, process where the Lord brought me to the place to where I was uh, ready to surrender my life to him. Now, dedication, I should be absolutely clear, is not a requirement for salvation. It is not a requirement for salvation. Uh, that would add works to the gospel message. And remember that the gospel message is very simple. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And here he says that Christ died for our sins, and this according to the scriptures. Uh, verse 4, and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to many, uh, to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then to more than 500 brethren at one time. But the good news, the gospel, has to do with the work of Christ on our behalf, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day and seen alive by many. And we understand uh, who he is as the Son of God who came into the world and took upon himself humanity, uh, and this in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We've spent some time in the past talking about that. And that he came into this world minus any contamination of sin, and then he lived his entire life and committed no sin. In his humanity, he committed no sin. And Jesus Christ, remember, is the God-man. He is the theanthropic person. He came in hypostatic union, which is undiminished deity, combined together forever with perfect humanity. And so the Christ that we believe in is, is in hypostatic union. It is, in fact, the second member of the Godhead, God the Son, uh, who took upon himself humanity. That is who our Savior is. Uh, now, in his humanity, he went his entire life and he committed no sin, and he willingly went to the cross and laid down his life and died in our place, the just for the unjust, uh, Peter tells us, 1 Peter 3.18. And so the good news, the gospel, is never what we do for God. That's not what salvation is. Uh, that's never what we do for God. Uh, salvation is what God has done for us through the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets all the glory. He gets all the credit. Now, we get the benefit. We get forgiveness of sins. We get eternal life. We get the gift of righteousness. We get many, many blessings. Uh, but he gets all the praise. He gets all the glory. So, again, dedication is not a requirement for salvation, for that would add works to the gospel message, and that's wrong. Salvation, remember, is a free gift. It is a free gift. And I think of Romans 6.23, which says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift of God. And remember that salvation is a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift. We do not pay for it in any way. And no good works are required before, during, or after salvation. It is a free gift. And a gift by its very nature means that it was paid in full by another person. And that we do not pay for it at all. Because if we have to contribute anything toward it, then it ceases to be a gift. And it becomes at that moment something we have purchased. But salvation is never said to be by works. It is said always to be a gift from God, and that was paid in full. And it is given by God as an act of grace. Remember Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, which says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For by grace, grace here uh, translates the Greek word kodos, um, and caudus refers to an unmerited gift, an unearned, undeserved uh, gift that is given to us. For by grace you have been saved. So this is not in any way predicated upon the beauty or worth of the object. It is in no way based upon works. And Paul is very clear on this. He says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now faith means that we simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We simply trust him to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves to save us. 
And uh, we trust in him and we trust in him alone. We do not trust in ourselves. We do not trust in any system of works. We trust in Christ and Christ alone. Uh, because man needs only Christ to be saved, no one else and nothing more. And faith itself does not save. Christ saves. Faith is merely the instrument by which we receive that salvation. So again, by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It, that is salvation, is the gift of God. Uh, Again, it is a gift. And again, Paul drives the point, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. If you contribute towards your salvation, then you have grounds for boasting. Uh, But that's not how it works. Salvation is a gift, and so no one can boast about that. Now, initial salvation is about justification. Remember phase one. Remember, in phase one salvation, we are saved from the penalty of sin. Phase two salvation, that's our sanctification, we are uh, being saved from the power of sin. And phase three is our glorification in which we are saved from the presence of sin. So again, initial salvation is about justification, which is a one-and-done event that occurs at the moment of faith in Christ. Romans 3.28, Paul says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So we are justified before who? Before God. That's who we are justified before. Paul says in Romans 4, 4 and 5, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. Now I've covered this in the past. And we might translate it this way. Now, to the one who works a 40-hour work week, his wage or his paycheck is not considered a gift, but what is due to him. Now, now God created work, and he created compensation for work uh, as a valid system. But salvation is not based on that system. It is not a works system. It is a grace system. And so it is a completely different way of thinking for us to have that paradigm shift to understand and to move away from a work system to a grace system. Uh, But he says in verse 5, he says, to the one who does not work, and you might parenthetically put 100% at all, does not work, but does what? But believes in him who justifies, and justifies who? The good, the moral, the righteous? Uh, No who justifies the ungodly, because that's me, that's you, that's all humanity. None of us deserve the kindness of God. We are classified as sinners. We are classified as ungodly. We are classified as dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, The Bible does not have anything flattering to say about mankind in our fallen state. And so when God saves us, he justifies the ungodly. So again, to the one who does not work, but believes in him, in the one who did all the work for us, because Christ did all the work of our salvation. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Romans 5.1, therefore having been justified by faith, not by works, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul said in Romans 3.24 that we are justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. We are justified, that is, we are declared just before God as a gift, and that is because we have received the gift of his righteousness. Now, justification is a single act that occurs at salvation and is not to be confused with our our experiential sanctification, which occurs over time. Now, listen, salvation, our initial act of salvation, that's simple. That's simple. And God brought it down to an irreducible minimum. He could not have made it more simple than to do one thing and one thing only, and that is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so simple that a child can do it and be saved. It is that simple to just simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we grow up and we get we complicate things because we grow up and, and we, we, we live in a world where everything is, is based upon works, merit system, 
And, uh, and in the world of men, that's fine. When I was studying at college, when I was studying at university and at seminary, uh, you know, when I went and I earned grades and I got good grades in school, uh, I earned that. I worked for that. And that's fine. In the world of, of mankind, that's fine. Uh, and so even when I go to work and I work very hard and I earn a paycheck, that's fine. That's a valid system. But again, I cannot bring that to God. Uh, and so my salvation is so simple, it's based upon the simple act of faith in Christ that a child can do it. Now, salvation, though it is simple, we should never confuse it uh, with somehow being cheap. And, I, and, and people get this strange idea that somehow, because it's simple, it's somehow cheap, because it doesn't require anything of us, because Christ did it all. It is very, very costly, very costly, because Christ paid for our sins. He paid our sin debt in full. And our salvation was very, very costly to God. But it cost us nothing. Salvation is a free gift to us. Now, discipleship, your advance to maturity as a Christian, that requires you to have some skin in the game. Now, that that's that requires some commitment. That requires some discipline. That requires some sacrifice on your part. That's our experiential sanctification. So again, when we think of justification, we, we should think of it as a single act that occurs at salvation. At that moment, God the Father, uh, we receive forgiveness of sins and that we also receive the gift of his righteousness. But again, that is a single act that occurs at salvation. And this is not to be confused with our experiential sanctification, which occurs over time. Again, that's phase two. So from the moment of faith in Christ until you leave this world by death or by rapture, that is phase two. That is our sanctification. Now, according to Norman Geisler, he says, and here I'm quoting him from his Systematic Theology, volume three, page 235, he says, quote, justification is an instantaneous past act of God by which one is saved from the guilt of, of sin. His record is cleared, and he is guiltless before the judge, end quote. And there he cites Romans 8, 1, which says, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so he's absolutely correct on that. But it should be understood as an instantaneous past act. Now, as Christians, we are justified in God's sight because Christ has borne all of our sin upon the cross and has paid our sin debt in full. Remember that after Jesus had borne our sins upon the cross and he bore all of our sins, past, present, and future, because all of our sins were, were future from the time of the cross. Now, he died for all the sins from the sin of Adam all the way into the future. He died for the sins of everyone, past, present, and future. All sin was placed upon him. And after he bore our sin upon the cross and paid our sin debt in full, he said, in the Greek, one word, to Telestai. Now, it's translated here in the English by three words, it is finished. Uh, and the form of the verb here is in the perfect tense, uh, which means that it is a past action, but the emphasis is always upon the abiding results, such that our salvation was finished at the cross with the result that it stands finished today and for all time, for all eternity. So it was finished at the cross. So during that time, Christ bore all of our sins upon the cross and paid our sin debt in full. And after we trust in Christ as our Savior, God freely gives us uh, his righteousness. Now remember in Romans 5.17, Paul calls it the gift of righteousness, the gift of righteousness. This is the very righteousness of God, which God takes and gives to us. He deposits it to us at the moment of faith in Christ. It is the gift of righteousness. It is his righteousness. It's not our righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him, this is God the Father, made Christ, remember, who knew no sin, that he made him, what? To be sin on our behalf. And so this speaks of Christ as the Lamb of God, 
uh, to whom all of our sin was placed on. So he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And again, this speaks of that trade-off where Christ bore our sin, our sin is taken from us and it was placed upon Christ, and then at the moment of faith in Christ, uh, the very righteousness of God is then given to us as a gift. Paul talked about this in Philippians 3, 9. He said that I may be found in him, notice, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. This is, uh, so this is not a righteousness that is based upon any law code. He said that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that, that what, that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ. Notice the righteousness which comes from God. This is a top-down truth. It is the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, and it, and it comes to us. Now, after we are saved eternally, God then calls us into a lifelong walk with him. This is phase two. This is our sanctification. So dedication happens after we are saved when we present ourselves to God for service. When we present ourselves to God for service. And we'll see a number of passages. We'll look at some of these and some of these will be presented. Paul says, for example, in Romans 6, 13, he says, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. Now, it's interesting here because Paul is writing to believers. Now, is it possible for a believer uh, to present his, himself or herself, uh, their members, uh, as instruments of unrighteousness? Well, of course they can. They can commit themselves to any sin that the unbeliever can commit. But he says, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, the very fact that, now this strikes me as interesting because the very fact that, that Paul is telling them to present themselves to God would imply that they had not done so. And, uh, and so he's telling them here, he says, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, here he does it again, by the mercies of God, notice, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And so this is, it's the presenting of ourselves to God. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit, he says, Submit therefore, to God. And submit there is a word we'll look at in the future. It translates the Greek verb hupotasso. It was actually a military term that uh, was borrowed and brought into the, into the New Testament by Paul in particular. Uh, Peter uses the word as well. But he says here, submit, and it means to rank under. It means to surrender oneself to the authority of another. And so this is here the directive to submit, therefore, to God, implying again that we have believers who had not done that thing. And so dedication happens after we are saved, when we present ourselves to God for service and walk in obedience to his will. First uh, Peter 1.14 says, as obedient children, because that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be obedient children. Uh, and sometimes we can be disobedient children. There were times where I was a rascal of a child and was not always an obedient child. Uh, but we are told to be obedient children to God. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. Question, is it possible for a believer to be conformed uh, to their former lusts? And the answer to that is yes. If it were not possible, then this directive would be meaningless. He says in verse 15, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And so this is a directive here to our sanctification. Now this relates again to our sanctification, which is ongoing as long as we live. We're talking about our walk with the Lord. In the sanctification process, the believer is constantly recalibrating his or her thinking, values, words, and actions to conform to the character and the will of God. 
Let me say that again. In the sanctification process, and again, we're talking about after faith in Christ, at that moment when we commit ourselves to the Lord, and when we dedicate ourselves to the Lord, in other words, what we're doing is we are committing ourselves to a lifelong service to Him. Now, that doesn't mean that we're not going to get off the path. We will, uh, sometimes briefly, sometimes for extended periods of time, but we always need to confess our sins, uh, take responsibility for whatever consequences God may bring down, and uh, and then get back on the path of righteousness righteousness, the path of service to the Lord. Uh, Remember um, uh, that relapse does not have to mean collapse, Uh, that we can have times where we fall out, but we always need, as long as we have breath, we have grace, and we can get up and we can uh, uh, dust ourselves off and lick our wounds and, and claim scripture and move on. Now, in the sanctification process, again, the Christian is constantly recalibrating his or her thinking. Now, I have to do this all the time, all the time. I'm constantly being challenged by human viewpoint, by viewpoints around me, from the media, from different sources, from music, from literature, from the source of my old sin nature, from old habits and ways of thinking. And so when I'm in a situation uh, and there's the possibility for me to deviate from the Word of God and the will of God, uh, and I may slip out on occasion, I may have a sinful thought or a sinful word, that does happen, Uh, but then I need to recalibrate, I need to realign my thinking, my values, my words and actions to conform to the character and to the will of God. Uh, So I need to get back on that path, and that's a constant thing throughout the Christian life. Now, dedication is a requirement for spiritual growth. As the believer with positive volition is yielded to God the Holy Spirit and is willing to learn and live God's Word. And it's always that two-step process because you cannot live what you do not know. And learning God's Word necessarily precedes living God's will. So you always have to learn it. Now, learning it is no guarantee that you will live it because you can have wisdom. And this is why in James 1.22, James says, Be ye doers of the word and not merely hearers only who delude themselves. And James 4.17, he says, Now to him who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. And so it is possible to know the right thing to do. It is possible and yet not do it. And I think of Solomon. Again, we're going to come back to Solomon. Again, we'll do some extensive studies in the future on Solomon. Very fascinating uh, study in the Bible. But he had wisdom. He had divine viewpoint. He wrote three books of the Bible, uh, largely most of uh, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, he wrote, and Song of Solomon. And he was a writer of Scripture. He was used by the Lord for 40 years to lead the nation of Israel. He spent seven years building the temple. He was used by the Lord. Uh, The Lord spoke to him directly on two occasions. He answered his prayer and gave him wisdom. And so Solomon uh, was a true and is a true believer. But by the end of his life, because he had made a series of bad decisions regarding relationships... Because he disobeyed Deuteronomy 17:17 17, 17, and the command that was given to the kings of Israel not to multiply wives, and he did in the worst possible way. Remember that by the end of Solomon's life, he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And, uh, and so by the end of his life, he had married many, many pagan women. And apparently they had brought their paganism, they had brought their idolatry into the home. And over time, they eventually influenced Solomon, and he turned away from the Lord. He began to build these places of worship uh, for his wives, and he began to worship these idols himself. And this is a man who had wisdom. But again, having wisdom is no guarantee that you will live by it. It is possible to know the will of God, to know the right thing, and not do it. Uh, The directive of James 4.17 sets that directive forth uh, very clearly. That truth uh, sets it forth very clearly, and Solomon is a good example of that. So again, dedication is the requirement for spiritual growth as the believer with positive volition is yielded, that is surrendered over to God the Holy Spirit, and is willing to learn and live 
God's Word. It's always that two-step process because we take it in. See, and that's what we're doing now. We're in that process right now where we are learning the Word of God. But as we take it in, as we learn it, then we must apply it as opportunity presents itself. And so that is phase uh, two there where we, when we think about the Christian walk, we learn it and then we apply it. And that's, that's the walk of faith. That's where we become obedient to the Word, believers, and we begin to live out God's Word. And spirituality is unhindered as long as positive as long as there is positive volition to God. That is, as long as the person is walking in that place of commitment or dedication or or commitment to the Lord, uh, and is walking, uh, learning, and living His Word. So spirituality then becomes unhindered again as long as there is positive volition to God. Now God has provided everything we need to live the spiritual life. He has provided everything that we need. Uh, First, he has redeemed us by the blood of Christ. He paid our sin debt, and he brought us into his family. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, "...knowing that you were not redeemed." And this gives us the use of the Greek verb lutrao, uh, which carries the idea of being purchased, that we were in a slave market of sin, and we could not purchase our own freedom, we could not liberate ourselves, but we were redeemed. Uh, he says, and he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers, uh, but on what basis were we were we redeemed? He says, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. So he purchased us. He paid our sin debt, and so on that basis we have been. Redeem. First Corinthians six twenty says, "For you have been bought with a price, and the price was the death of Christ. It was His death upon the cross. That His blood, His, his the shed blood of Christ, as I've set forth before, is the coin of the heavenly realm that paid our sin debt, and it paid it in full. But uh, Paul here says, "For you have been bought with a price." Therefore, glorify God in your body. And here he's talking to believers, again, about this idea of serving the Lord, of glorifying God. So we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We have been forgiven all of our sins. Now, though Christ died for all of our sins, the benefits of the cross are applied at the moment of salvation. Remember Acts 10.43, uh, here he says, "...of him all the prophets bear witness," that is, of Christ, that through his name, notice, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. So at the moment of faith in Christ, everyone who believes in him at that moment receives forgiveness of sin. So the benefits of the cross are applied at the moment of faith in Christ. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood. Notice the forgiveness of of our sins, and this is according to the riches of His grace. According to the riches of His grace, so um, not only are we forgiven our sins, but we have been brought into the family of God. John one twelve says, "But as many as received Him, as many as received Him." You see, there's positive volition for the unbeliever. This is talking about phase one salvation. As many as have received Him, notice to them He gave the right to become children of God. Well, who are the ones who received him? Notice, even to those who believe in his name. Now, when the unbeliever becomes a believer, when they believe in Christ and uh, they believe in his name, they trust in him, uh, uh, John goes on, he says, "...who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God." You see, at the moment of faith in Christ, we are then said to be born again. Uh, 1 Peter 1.3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy, notice, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And in one twenty three, he says, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, that is, uh, but he says, excuse me, for you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. So 
he has caused us to be born again, and he has given us eternal life. So salvation is not merely subtraction. It's not merely the removal of sins. It's also addition. It's also the addition that we receive eternal life. Notice John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him, that simple faith in Christ, again, a child can do it, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have excuse me, eternal life. John 10, 28, Jesus says, and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So we receive at that moment eternal life. We're also given adoption as sons. You see, we are adopted into the very family of God. Uh, Galatians 4, let me back up here to Galatians 4, 4. He says, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, that is from heaven. Remember, he came in hypostatic union, that God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem, there's that payment of a price again. Uh, Exagorazo is the word here. It means to be purchased out of, out of a marketplace. Uh, so that we, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. You see, it's interesting because we are adopted into the family of God. We're adopted children. Ephesians one five says that he predestined us. Notice to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, and this according to the kind intention of his will. Not only that, but we are made saints in Christ Jesus. Romans 1, seven says to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints. The word saint in the Bible is just simply a synonym for a believer. It is just a synonym for a believer. Uh, the Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church and other organizations have uh, ruined the term saint by creating this superclass of believers uh, who are hyper-righteous, supposedly. Uh, but that's, that's a false idea. That's not a biblical idea. You don't find that in the Bible. You find the term saints used in the Bible. In fact, in 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul calls the Corinthians, he calls them saints, now, that just simply means that they're a synonym. It's a synonym for being a believer. That's all it is. It's just a synonym for being a Christian. I'm St. Steve. Uh, here we got St. Dan, uh, St. Stephanie, uh, St. Uh, Judd. We got uh, several saints with us this evening here, all just believers. But when you read through uh, the letter to the Corinthians, you realize that these were some, well, they were sinning saints is what they were. They were sinning Christians. They were very immature. Paul calls them immature in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 3. But nonetheless, we are made saints in Christ Jesus. And we are given the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in us. Came to comes Has come to dwell in us. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, Paul says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God? Notice, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That the Spirit of God dwells in you. And we have been transferred from Satan's domain of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, these are many of the things that God has done for us. And I bring this up because all of these things that God has done for us, the fact that we have forgiveness of sins, the fact that we have the gift of righteousness, the fact that we have eternal life, the fact that we have adoption as sons, the fact that we are saints, uh, the fact that the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within us, these are all wonderful things that God has done for us to prepare us for our walk with him. Uh, and so he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of, of the beloved son. And he has given us a new spiritual nature, a new spiritual nature. Now, we have a sin nature that continues. It's been handicapped, but it has not been removed. Uh, but we also have a new nature within us, a new nature in fact, Paul says in Romans 7.21, he says, I find then the principle that, that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Uh, now, we'll talk about this at a later time when we'll talk about grieving the spirit and quenching the spirit because we'll spend some time talking about the sin nature there. Uh, but Paul says in verse 22, For I joyfully concur with the law of God in my inner man. 
That is, there is a part of us within ourselves that has a new nature that wants to serve the Lord. Uh, But we have to struggle back and forth sometimes with our sin nature. Notice in Ephesians 4, uh, he says in verse 22, he says that in reference to your former manner of life, notice he says here that you lay aside the old self, uh, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, Uh, that is, that you learn to operate according to that new nature, that you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness and uh, and of the truth. And Colossians 3, 9 and 10, do not lie to one another. Is it possible for believers to lie to one another? The answer to that is yes. And he says here, do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self, with its evil practices, and have put on the new self. You see, we have a new nature. And not only that, but God has provided us with a spiritual gift. Uh, Because at the moment of faith in Christ, we are given a spiritual gift. Now, my gift was given to me when I was saved, and it is the gift of teaching. I didn't ask for it, didn't earn it, certainly don't deserve it. But it was nonetheless given to me at the moment uh, that I came to faith in Christ. Now, it did not begin to develop until I had surrendered myself to the Lord and began to walk with him. Uh, But he has nonetheless provided us with a spiritual gift. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a special gift, notice he says, Employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so, as each one of us has received a spiritual gift, we are to put it into service. We are to employ it. Uh, Notice, in serving one another. Whatever your spiritual gift happens to be, and for everybody it's a little bit different, uh, depending upon how God places you within the body of Christ with regard to the place where he wants you to serve. But you are nonetheless to employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And, as I've mentioned before in Ephesians 1, 3, that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Uh, That he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And not only that, but God has provided us the divine revelation that we need to educate us on how to live righteously. And it really is an education. It really is an education. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 Uh, It's a very interesting passage because we have to have the Word of God to instruct us into righteous living. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 16, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God. Now, literally, the Greek reads, Pasa grafe theopneustos. Pasa grafe, all Scripture. And the word grafe there uh, refers to the written word written word. In fact, uh, uh, it comes over into the English like autograph or photograph, but here graphe refers to the written scripture. He says, and is inspired, theopneustos, literally God breathed. Uh, And notice he says all scripture is profitable. It's profitable for what? Well, it's profitable for teaching because we have to be taught how to live the Christian life. We have to be taught what it is to walk. I've had many discussions with a good friend of mine, and we go back and forth, and uh, he's a growing believer, and I have a lot of respect for him. He he struggles. I think it's good that he struggles, because it's a sign of growth. If you're not struggling, you're probably not growing. Uh, But uh, we've had discussions on how do you know what's right, and I said, well, anytime you use the term right, you assume a standard. You assume that that something is right according to a standard. And if we say that something is right, in the Christian sense, we're assuming it based upon the standard set forth in the Word of God. And so we talk about, uh, we talk about living the right life or the righteous life. Uh, but nonetheless, we cannot know what that is if we don't take the time to study. So it is profitable to us for teaching because we have to be instructed in what is righteous living. And listen, this can be tough at times. I mean, you get into things like love your neighbor, or excuse me, love your enemy, uh, or you know, pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you uh, to bless them and, and do not curse them. 
And do not seek your own, rev- own, own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And you think about certain aspects of the Christian life can be very demanding. In fact, it is a walk of faith and not feelings. Now, I like my feelings. I've said it before. They're a gift from God. But when I'm driving in life, my feelings need to stay in the back seat. My feelings do not need to be up in the front seat. They do not need to be riding shotgun, and they certainly do not need to be in the driver's seat. Uh, I need to have wisdom driving my life. Now, positive volition keeps wisdom in the driver's seat and keeps feelings in the back seat. And my feelings in the back seat at times will throw a tantrum. They will scream and they will rage and they will try to direct uh, my life. And I cannot let, I love my feelings, but I can't, I have to keep them in the back seat. I have to, I have to let wisdom drive uh, the vehicle. I cannot let emotion do that. But you see, if I'm going to let wisdom drive the vehicle, I have to know what that is. I have to know where God wants me to go. I have to know what truth is. I have to know what wisdom is. I have to know these things. Well, the Word of God gives me that. So again, all Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching. Because again, we cannot live what we do not know. And once we come to faith in Christ, once we come to believe in Christ, and we enter into phase two of the Christian life, and we see all the blessings that God has given to us, we see that we have forgiveness of sins, we see that we have eternal life, we see that we have the gift of righteousness, we see that we have adoption as sons, uh, that we are brought into the family of God, that we're born again, uh, that we're given a spiritual gift, that he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, that he's transferred us from Satan's domain of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son, and we realize all of these wonderful blessings that God has done for us, well, what it does is it motivates us. It motivates me to want to serve him uh, from a life of gratitude. I'm not trying to work for my salvation, but I am trying to work out my salvation. And so there is a deep sense of gratitude within myself because I realize that he has not only plucked me from the, from the ash heap of my own ruin, uh, but he has also rescued me from the lake of fire. I will never face the lake of fire. Uh, heaven is my future home, and I have that. And God has provided that for me. He has blessed me with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, and he has, one, he has done such wonderful, wonderful things things for me. And because I have taken the time uh, to dig into the Word of God and to learn these things and from study and to study from other gifted teachers and to lay hold of these biblical truths, it has fired me up to want to serve him, to want to walk with him, to want to serve him out of gratitude and to say thank you, Father, and to let my life be a life that glorifies him, that edifies others, and uh, it, it to me it's the best life that can be lived. But these things have to be taught. You're not going to get a soda pop and go sit under a tree somewhere and come up with these things. That's not how it works. The Christian life is a disciplined life, and it means disciplining ourselves to take the time to study, to study, to study his word, to take these things in. And once we learn them, then to apply them. You see, that's where the real growth happens, is when we take that truth and we put it into real life application. And the word of God speaks broadly to the major areas of life. It doesn't tell us everything about everything, but what it does reveal is what God deems important for us to know. And God speaks to us with regard to how we should serve government or not serve government, you know, because there's times where there are legitimate acts of civil disobedience, where the believer has not only the right, but the duty to say no to government when that government seeks to lead us away from the will of God. And we have to say no to that. And there are examples of that, whether it's in Exodus 2 or Daniel 3 or Daniel 6 or Acts 5 or a number of passages. We'll hit on those in the future. But the Bible otherwise tells us to 
be uh, submissive to the government, to submit to the government, hupotasso, uh, that we are to be good citizens. You see, the Bible speaks to that. The Bible speaks to us with regard to our marriage as husbands, to love the wives, as wives to uh, respect their husbands and to uh, submit to them. And uh, the Bible speaks with regard to how we are to relate to other believers. It speaks to our finances. Uh, It speaks to many, many areas of our life. And as we take these things in, then we take that truth and we apply that truth to that area of life where God is directing us. But again, we have to be taught these things. These are things that have to uh, come to us by way of understanding in his word. This is why we study. So God has given us divine revelation in the Bible to educate us on how to live righteously. So again, all scripture is inspired by God and it is profitable for teaching, for teaching and for reproof because we need to be shown where we're wrong. Earlier I mentioned that I'm constantly recalibrating my thinking uh, to make sure that it properly aligns with God and his word. Uh, But the word of God shows me where I am wrong. It reproves me. And I need to be corrected. Uh, And the flip side of that is for correction, for reproof, for correction, because it doesn't do any good to show somebody where they're wrong if you're not going to show them what is right. But notice the last clause here, for training in righteousness. For training. You see, the word of God, this goes back to the scripture, is profitable to us for training in righteousness in righteousness. Because if we are going to live phase two of the Christian life, if we are going to advance to maturity, if we are going to be believers who are living out the righteous life, then we need to be trained in that. We need to be instructed in that. Uh, Verse 17, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work, because again, we are not going to be able to produce the good works that God wants us to produce if we are not properly educated in the Word of God. And this is why biblical education is so important. This is why we take the time to work through these things. I also think of Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, where it speaks here about the righteous man, where the righteous and the wicked are contrasted. And the writer here says, "...how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked." nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. You see, he doesn't have anything to do with the wicked. Uh, He is separated from them in all aspects of his life, his walking, his standing, his sitting, because that speaks to all of the activities of life. But here we have this believer, this righteous believer. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And the word law here translates the Hebrew noun Torah, which simply means instruction or Uh, guidance or direction. So here his delight, notice, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And meditates here, again, is that Hebrew verb, hagah, uh, which means to fill the mind. It means that there's a focus upon the word of God. And the benefit, what's the benefit of that? What's the benefit of the believer who meditates on the word of God day and night? Well, he will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and in whatever he does he prospers that is in the will of God. So again God has given us divine revelation in the Bible to educate us on how to live righteously. Now though God has blessed us and continues to bless us it is necessary for us to lay hold of those blessings and to walk in submission to the Lord obeying his directives. And so we have to be willing to say yes to the word of God and be willing to obey it. Because again, James 1, 22, be doers of the word and not merely hearers only. Listen, I love that people come to Bible class. I love that people listen to my podcast. I'm glad that people watch my videos online. I'm glad that people watch the Lessons live stream on Facebook. I'm glad that people come to my house personally. We don't have anybody here tonight. Next week we will, but tonight I'm broadcasting live from my from my home uh, to an online audience. But I'm glad that people come to Bible class. But it, there has to be a point where we take that truth and that we we then apply it 
to life because again that's really where the action is so though god has blessed us and continues to bless us and he does continue to bless us whether that's with basic things like air and food and water you know when you're talking about logistical grace those basic provisions that god gives to us on a daily basis whether we're good or bad uh, air to breathe and water to drink and food to eat you know those basic blessings that we have And we take those things in, so he continues to bless us. But with regard to the word of God, it is necessary for us to lay hold of those blessings, whether it's the truth of his word or a spiritual gift that we have, and to walk in submission to the Lord, obeying his directives. Now, some of the directives that God gives us is, for example, to be filled with the Spirit. To be filled with the Spirit. Now, this is an interesting passage here, and we will unpack this. We'll spend probably a couple days on this verse alone in the near future. But Paul says here, and do not get drunk with wine. Now, again, he's talking to believers. And is it possible for a believer to get drunk with wine? Yes, it is. That's absolutely possible. The Bible does not condemn drinking. Let me be clear. The Bible does not condemn drinking, does not condemn alcohol. It does condemn drunkenness. And Paul says here, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, asotia, sickness without a cure. But he says, but be filled with the Spirit. And the word filled here translates the Greek verb plerao. Uh, the form of the verb is a present passive imperative in the Greek. The present tense is ongoing action. It means that we keep on being filled with the Spirit. Um, the imperative mood is a command. We are commanded to allow the Spirit to, to act upon us. What's interesting is that it's in the passive voice, which means that we are commanded to receive that which the Spirit gives. And by the way, the filling of the Spirit does not mean that we have more of the Spirit at one time and less at another. It really means that the Spirit has more of us. We might say that the filling of the Spirit means that the Spirit is fulfilling in us all that he desires. In other words, we are yielded to the Spirit. And again, we will talk about that in the future. But the fact that it's in the imperative mood, I've mentioned this before in the Greek, when you find a verb in the imperative mood, it always assumes three things. It assumes intellect, that you understand the directive. It assumes volition, that is the ability to obey the directive. And it assumes present and or future opportunity because you cannot command past action. And so the fact that believers are commanded to be filled with the Spirit means that there is something on their side, on the human side, on the side of the believer, whereby they must exercise their volition in this relationship between them and God the Holy Spirit. And so these are things that we will unpack Again, in the weeks ahead. And I know I'm hitting you with a lot. I know it's probably feeling like you're standing in front of several fire hoses, taking in a lot of information. Uh, But give it time. These things will become unpacked over time. But it really has to do, again, largely with us taking in this information. And some of us, this we've probably heard this a thousand times. I've taught this a hundred times. This is information that I have covered on many, many occasions. For some of you, this may be the very first time that you're hearing this. And so this may be brand new to you, and you may feel a little bit overwhelmed. Well, hang in there. Don't give up. There are These are things that, that, that eventually God will sort out in your thinking. You just have to stay with it. You just kind of have to hang in there for a while. And eventually these things will begin to uh, become understandable to you. So it is 7 o'clock. We have uh, spent an hour uh, working through this material. We haven't made it very far, but that's all right. Uh, We're taking our time through a lot of this material. I'm not really rushing uh, through this material. Uh, But that will put a bow here on at least this section of it. All right. Do we have any questions or comments over tonight's material? Uh, Judd, get us started, buddy. Or is it what? Uh, two, two things. First, I think this is very good teaching because I think the key is what is the relationship between justification and sanctification? Right. And I think everybody, almost everybody gets it wrong. 
I think the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox, in your terminology, which I love, I keep using that, I, I stole it and I use it all the time now, the uh, Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox make works a co-requisite with faith. Yeah. It, very, very um, explicitly they say, yes, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, but you also need works. Mm-hmm. Co-requisite. Mm-hmm. So that's a blending of justification and sanctification. Right. right. Yeah. They. Then, co- yeah. They. Co- uh, yeah. They conflate the two. They. They bring them together. Yes. Yeah. yes. And then uh, Reformed theology, same thing, but they make it a post requisite. Correct. That they're they're conflating justification and sanctification. Mm-hmm. They're saying yes, justification is by faith alone, and then that's the Reformed theology uh, saying. But the faith that saves is never alone. Which, right. That's a self-defeating statement. <laughs> that, 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 it that is. can't be correct. It is. <laughs> it's either alone or it, it isn't. It can't be both alone and not alone. Right. So I think the correct formulation, and this is where you know you said that's a, that's very good advice at hmm. the end, that it takes a long time to understand this and make rightly dividing the word of truth, make the proper division between justification and sanctification, mm-hmm. which is that sanctification is normative, mm-hmm. right? There should be Christian growth after justification. But if you make it absolute, then that's wrongly dividing the word of truth because mm-hmm. there are cases where people have justification, but they fail to grow in the grace and knowledge Correct. Of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's Correct. number one. And then number mm-hmm. two, we're talking with somebody who Winnie has known since they were in high school. And he keeps saying, but I don't feel saved. Mm. I just don't feel like I'm saved. I don't feel worthy of being saved. So I think that's another error that you can get into is that there's some type of a magical and I think that's mysticism, right? There's some right. type of a mystical mountaintop experience that if you don't have it, you're not saved. Correct. No, I get that too. And that's one of those things where understanding the Word of God and being able to live by faith and not feelings uh, becomes very, very important to understand. And, you know, when people, you know, even even when I fail... As a believer, when I commit sin, and I know when I commit sin, whether it's mental attitude, sins, verbal sins, sins of the flesh, omission, commission, whatever it happens to be, when I commit my sin, I know that at that moment I have grieved the spirit, I've quenched the spirit, I'm operating in status quo carnality, and I realize that at that moment, if I, I may be subject to divine discipline if I stay there, uh, so I try to keep my sins small and keep them few, and I try to rebound off, I mean immediately, quickly, I don't mess around, um, But I never question my salvation. And I don't question it because I know what the Word of God says, and I know the one that I have believed in. I know the one in whom I have trusted. And and it's interesting to me that I, I... you know, over time, you know what the Word of God says, and by faith, you accept that is true, and so you find that it produces within you a relaxed mental attitude such that you're not afraid of those things. And you're absolutely right. The believer, and I've made this comment before, and we'll hit on it again, but the believer who is uh, devoid of God's Word uh, really, uh, almost by default, uh, goes to experience or feelings uh, as a metric for trying to determine what is true or what is right or what is wrong. And it's such a flawed system, and that is why it is so important that after salvation that we get into the Word of God and we begin to study, 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 and to really understand. And not only to understand, but to apply that truth to our life, because the sooner that we can learn the Word and live the Word, the sooner we will find stability within our own souls. And we will not have those questioning things predicated on vacillating feelings or experiences. I mean, I can feel great and be totally in sin. I can feel terrible and be totally in the will of God. How I feel is not the point. But but you're right. And 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 you know, when I'm talking with believers, I remember having a discussion one time with somebody about um, salvation being a gift, and it's not by works. And this lady. Uh, kept going back to, well, I have to do some works. And I'll tell you what, I bet I sat on Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 uh, for probably a good 90 minutes. 
And I remember we just kept going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And and finally, after a while, it finally began to sink in because every time she would come back and start talking about works, I would say, look, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should And finally, it broke through. And finally, she said, okay, I understand what the Word of God says. I accept it as true. And at that point, there was a breakthrough, but it just kept going back to the Word, back to the Word. It's it's not how do you feel, it's what does the Word of God say? And do you accept it as true and stop and trust it more than your feelings? And I think that becomes part of the challenge. So uh, you got your work cut out for you, I suspect. (laughs) All right, any other questions or comments tonight? I'm not seeing anything. There we go. Miss Stephanie. Stephanie, give it to us. Hey, I just wanted to say uh, thank you. I appreciate it because I know you weren't feeling well. You did a great job. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm usually not 100% when I'm dealing with a migraine, and then my medication kind of drops my IQ about 10 or 15 points. So um, um, th- yeah. th- thank God for the notes. I can always stick with the notes in the scripture. So, But I appreciate that. Thank you very much. All right, anybody else have any questions or comments? It looks to be a wrap, Steve. Okay, well, let's wrap it up with a word of prayer, shall we? Dear Father, we thank you for this evening, for this time of fellowship together, for studying your word, uh, for this important information uh, that is set forth for us in your word with regard to the spiritual life. Father, we just pray as we take this time to uh, continue to look at these things, that this will be a time of fruitful understanding, uh, whereby we will be challenged by the things that we study, Father, that we might grow thereby. Father, we just pray that tonight's uh, a time of study and fellowship together will be honoring to you and edifying to us. Father, we thank you. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen.